Hello, everybody. Can you hear, see me, etc.? I hope everything works. Sweet. Thanks. I think we've still got a lot of people coming through. So we'll give we'll give everyone a minute. So we're going to have uh, a few seminars today in this session. I'm just going to start off with a quick overview of the facilities. And CU is going to talk about um, how to use it and give a live demo. CU, are you there? Hi, Spix. Yes. All right, cool. Um, so I'll just give my usual talk and then I'll hand it over to you at some point. Um, we still have people streaming in, so we might get started soon. I think we're recording anyway. Yes, so we are. Okay, let's try to get this started. I'm guessing you're seeing the other one. Are you seeing the main slides now, I hope? Yes, that's the main one. Sweet. Pin myself as well. Uh oh. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining in for this session. Hopefully, today you'll get to see with the computing facilities available, at least for those of you who have access to computing clusters, which is pretty much all UQ students and staff. Uh, you'll see that staff get access to a few more facilities, obviously, uh, but undergrad students still get access to some facilities. HDR students get access to the same facilities and more, um, and we'll talk about those soon. Um, now, I know that there are a few um, colleagues of mine from the AI Collaboratory joining in, so what I was going to do was to give you a TLDR um, with a little bit of fun mixed in and see what happens. So uh, I'm sure you might not, many of you will not understand some parts of this slide and that's okay. So hopefully we will address the rest of it in the remaining parts of the talk. And then you can come back and look at the TLDR and go, oh, yeah, OK. So benefit for those also watching the recording, this might be the best place to start. So um, I'm going to talk mostly for my colleagues at the AI Collaboratory. And um, yeah, we have a new cluster. It's uh, in Banya. And this is the hardware that we've just got. It's the nearly the state of the art, uh, the state of the art slightly improved over the last three months. But over the last 12 months, we've been trying to put something together and we've gotten three, well, we've gotten this power edge server. It looks like that. It's, uh, so it's sitting on a server rack in dungeon somewhere. Uh, and it's an Ampere A100. Don't worry if you know, don't know what that is yet. It's got 80 gigs of RAM. Also, don't worry if you don't know, understand what that is yet. And we've got three of them, which is great. So I got nine cards. However, the admin gods are not going to let you have it all for yourself. And so all what, you, what they've got to do is they've got to spread it out and make sure it's fair, make sure it doesn't crash, 
And so there's this something called a slurm queue uh, that sits on top, regulating the access to this hardware. And of course, to make sure that everybody can get access to this equally, there's actually, you don't get access to the Slurm system, uh, which is infrastructure sitting there. The admin gods need you to log in to the system via a login node. And so um, you get onto that node. And of course, everybody has different requirements. So everything is actually blank. There's no setup for probably what you're trying to do. And so you need to set up your environment. Um, and uh, you'll be surprised to know when you get into the login node, um, it uses something, uh, an arcane thing called a terminal. Uh, some people in the 1970s decided that that's the best way to access uh, supercomputers or even computers in general. Um, and you can think of a terminal like a direct access, if you were to make it, if your brain had a terminal, it would probably be direct instructions for you to do something to your brain. And then the brain does it to the rest of your body. Um, and so a terminal is an incredibly powerful thing, but incredibly low level. So here's how to set up an environment. It's just a quick overview. The admins have got Anaconda installed, which is a Python distribution. You can create an, an environment. You need to do some magic to make sure that your terminal knows that you're trying to use this distribution. Uh, you activate whatever you wanna use that environment, you need to activate it. And uh, this is a one-time thing. You need to install your framework of choice. In this case, I got PyTorch, but you can use set TensorFlow or that Jax or whatever you're using. All right, so you've got an environment, you can log in and there's a queue that you can access. Now, how do you access the queue? As you can see, it's a bit complicated when it could be a lot simpler and we're actually working towards making it simpler. But the bottom line is, You've got, a, you've got some sort of a script. It has some settings, which we will talk about. You need to load this module that you just installed. You need to make sure your current script runs it. You need to activate your environment, and then you run your script. And this goes through the Slurm. And so Slurm gets all the settings, comes over here, and then sits here in the queue. And then when it's your turn, you get what you asked for and it runs your thing. And this is how you run it. To make things nice and more complicated, uh, you first need to probably sign up. If you're a HDR student, depending on the cluster you get access to, you'll have to sign up. Uh, for those AI collaboratory, I've already sent an email, you need to sign up. Um, or leaders will sign up first and the leaders will assign you access. And then you can go through all of the system. But that's the TLDR of it. Took five minutes. Um, now, what does all of this mean? So this is what this session is about. We try to explain what that is, what an environment is, what the login, what this machine does, uh, and how, what does this mean? Um, and hopefully that makes sense. So let's get started. Oh, and by the way, here's, because I'll share the slides, Here's an example full script for Banya for, for the AI collaboratory members, an example of what you can do. And you've got the, all of these settings um, and we'll talk about those later. All right. So the most important thing when you're doing machine learning, deep learning is this graphical processing unit. What are they? Here's an example of an older one, uh, a 2080, um, and these are actually in one of the computer labs. There's about 40 of them in a computer lab, uh, which I've booked for Summer of AI, which I'll talk about maybe a bit later. But um, so as summer scholars or interns, you have access to that computer lab. It's not a big card, but that physically goes into a desktop. And it's got seven teraflops or seven 
uh, 10 to the minus, oh, sorry, 10 to the nine floating point operations. So that's quite a lot of operations. And the main distinguishing feature of a graphical processing unit, here you have this thing on the CPU and that's probably your normal computer that you've been used to using. And you actually have multiple threads or cores on your CPU. Uh, in this computer that I'm using, it has six cores um, and 12 threads, so six times two. But usually you will have, I don't know, six, maybe even eight these days. And so what that basically means is you have eight threads in which to do processing. So you could have Word run on one of them, uh, some operating system stuff running on another. You could have a browser running on another. If you have Chrome, it probably uses all eight, probably does 16 and then crash, but never mind. Um, uh, and so all of these things use multiple processes. And so they speed things up because you can do things in parallel. There's only eight, maybe if you're lucky, 32, 48. And then you have your main memory. This is referred to as system memory or RAM only, simply as RAM. And there is a bus that connects the CPU to the main memory. And that's usually a PC, um, oh, sorry, the yeah, PCI Express bus. And so that's around, you know, 30 to 50 gigabytes per second. So if you want to do anything, um, uh, so your data will reside in main memory and to process it, it goes to the CPU, which then gets splits into threads, which you may have to do. Um, all of these factors, this how, how, how fast it can read from memory, how many threads all affects the processing time. Now, if you remember, well, I will talk about it. I've already covered it last year, yesterday. But neural networks have millions and billions of parameters. This is going to be really slow. If you do multi matrix multiplication, it's going to use one core at a time to do each multiplication. Uh, it's probably smarter than that because it, it, you, you use your 40 point um, uh, units on each of these and it speeds things up, but you're not going to get two or three factors faster. A GPU, a GPU, each one of these green things doesn't quite, it isn't as powerful as one of these cores, but, and it doesn't run as fast as these cores, but it's very close. And the GPU has thousands of these. So the, this one in here would have had 2,000, two, two and a half thousand. Uh, the A100 I showed you in the previous slide or previous slides, that has about 10 to 12,000. So you can imagine the speed up. And also the GPU has its own memory. And this is the video memory or VRAM. It's different from this RAM. Um, and so one of the things you'll have to understand is that you have to actually get your data to the GPU memory first. And so you can utilize this faster bandwidth. This is faster memory, more expensive faster memory runs three to four times faster than the system memory. So the first stage is to copy it, your data over to the GPU memory. And then these frameworks like TensorFlow, JAX, PyTorch, they've all been optimized so that when you run a convolution or a matrix multiplication or anything to do with arrays or tensors, it splits it up across the 10,000 threads and runs it in parallel, which means you can achieve things that are 100 to 1,000 times faster, order of milliseconds, that would take a, G a CPU to do in a second. So it's ex extremely fast. And that's where the main bulk of the speeding up of your training happens. And so these things, you see the big fans, these things run really hot. They use a lot of power. And so they create a lot of noise. And so the reason why we have big clusters that have lots of GPUs is that you can put them stacked, like in the previous slide, into these server things, stack heaps of them, put them in a small room, super cool it, and not worry about noise because it can insulate it. If you put it into a desktop, put it in your, in your office, it's going to heat up your office. It's going to make a heat ton of noise 
uh, and generally reduce the well, well-being of anybody in there. Okay. So yeah, highly parallel. One of the big things that has made a big difference to why we're seeing a lot of AI um, recently is because these things are quite cheap, relatively speaking. So the A100 I showed you in the previous slide, it's about $30,000 each, but um, a high end of these cards can cost up to three to $4,000. Um, but they can go down if you're doing desktop stuff like this one in particular is about $900 or used to be. Um, so they're relatively affordable. Um, and of course they run at high speed and TensorFlow and PyTorch are actually optimized to run across the GPU, but they underneath use these special libraries. Um, if you have an NVIDIA card, it's called CUDA and CUDNN, DNN stands for Deep Neural Networks. If you have an AMD card, it's called ROCM, R-O-C-M. There we go. And um, we actually in uh, UQ have these as well although uh, they're also on Banya, on the new cluster. They've actually been funded through UQ. Um, so those ones are actually available also for machine learning. Unfortunately, TensorFlow jacks do not support ROCKM. PyTorch does. I have no idea how stable it is. So uh, your mileage will vary. And the great thing is, of course, all of this stuff is open source. Uh, NVIDIA keeps some of their stuff hidden underneath but for the most part it's open in the sense that you can download and look at all the code uh and yeah you have tensorflow jacks pytorch to do the stuff all right so you saw this uh witchery black magic that was slurm so what is this slurm thing so it's a highly supposedly a highly scalable uh cluster management i'm going to annoy a lot of um, admins i hope they're not in the chat uh or watching this <laughs> i'll probably get banned Anyway, um, so Slurm is this open source, highly scalable uh, system. And what it does is you can ask for specific resources and amount of time uh, and where to send notifications to. Um, and it will allow you to queue, execute, monitor, and then report back what happened. Um, and so, it looks complicated, but basically here you are as a user, you have a series of commands, which we'll talk about. Uh, you send it to controllers and like this, uh, these are the things that actually control all of the, um, all of the hardware. And eventually it's sent down to where all the computation nodes are. Um, and this is where all of the magic happens in terms of uh, the actual model building training so slurm commands uh we'll have a demo of this but you'll get to see them in use hopefully um so you can ask information about the the hpc you can hpc hpc means high performance computing platform so our clusters or supercomputers and you can get the info you so here's this info it basically tells you what all of the um, all of the different uh, GPUs are actually currently doing. So here's, these ones are all mostly lying idle. Some of them are partially being used. Um, some are fully allocated and some are actually just down. You can look at the queue so you can see who's running what job and you could add a dash U and then your username to see what jobs are you, you're running. Um, and you can launch a job and you can cancel jobs. Okay, so what does this Slurm script do? And I was, I've been talking about that. Uh, and of course, CU is gonna actually do a live demo. So he's gonna run through all of these to hopefully try to explain it in more detail. Uh, but you have all of these, um, these uh, specific instructions. So you can allocate the number of jobs, uh, so number of nodes. So I remember we purchased three nodes. So you can get up to th well, three or more nodes. Usually it's, you, you only use one node. Um, you usually use one core because you're not really going to use too many cores, but you can set this to four or eight just so you get enough throughput and loading your data. 
you give the job a name. So that'll what that's what's going to be shown in the queue. Um, uh, I think this is the number of CPUs. I think these two are the same. Uh, anyway, uh, that's the number of CPUs. You have, you can get the system to mail you when something happens. So if something is uh, canceled or fails or finishes running, it'll mail you. This is the email address you use. How much memory you want. Now, this is important because this is system memory, not video memory. So um, video memory is not controllable. You get what you get by asking for a specific GPU. Um, and then you can set an output file, an error file. And here's an important bit. This is where you ask for the GPU. So you say, I want that um, GPU. In this case, this is on Rangpur, so which is a cluster that's available to you. And I'll be talking about that soon, what's available to you. So this is a virtual GPU and it has 20 gigs of RAM. And so you only get 20 gigs of RAM, VRAM that is, okay? And I'm asking for one GPU. You can get multiple GPUs if your code supports it. For the vast majority of you, you will only be using one. Then you need to load the module I was saying, then you need to activate your, um, your environment. You need to go into this folder that you wrote, got your script in and then run the script. So what do you have access to? So for all UQ HDR students and UQ staff, you have to request access. You have to get request. You have to request access to um, the Vina cluster or Wiener cluster. So you need to talk to the QBI admins. And here's the email. I'll share the slides. Here's a user guide. You need to be on the UQ network to see this guide. And what you get is there are 16 V100, so they're previous generation. Um, and 16 of them have 16 gigs of VRAM. So if you have two dimensional data and you're just trying deep learning, these are more than good enough. Then you have 16 V100 with 32 gigs of RAM. So if you need very, uh, not very large, but large models that you probably want these ones. Use the guide to show how to pick how they, uh, how you can pick the difference between these two. There's a subtle difference. Um, and here we're running at about 10 teraflops. So a lot better than the um, card that I showed you, which was a 2080. And it, and it uses learn. Okay. Now for all undergrads, so all the interns and summer scholars, as well as the HDR students and staff also uh, have access to the EAT faculties um, uh, Rangpur cluster. Um, and it's accessible to all UQ staff, even though it's an EAT thing. So, sorry, it's available to all UQ um, students and staff. Uh, so as long as you have a UQ username, you can get access to this and you can get more information here. These have a mixture of very new and very old infrastructure. There are 16 of these A100. So they have really cool new uh, A100s. They're not as big as the ones from Banya uh, for up to 40 gigs. And I showed you before you can get, uh, actually, if I go back, you can see what's available here. So there's a, there's a couple which are 40s, they're 20s, and there's 10 gig cards as well. There are older P100, so that's the previous generation to the, so these are the Pascal, these are the Volters, this is the Ampere, and the Pascal cards are still pretty good. They're 16 gigs, there's, there's four of them, so there's 12 GPUs that you can have access to. Not many people use these, so if you just want to trust some stuff that's there, undergraduate access also uses slow. Uh, mm -hmm. There are some other uh, clusters that you can request access to. They don't have GPUs in them, but they have heaps of CPU power that you can use. Um, and if you're interested, and if this, if we there's a particular content that you'd like and we haven't covered it, um, chances are the RCC will look after the, the Wiener cluster and all of these clusters uh, actually run training regularly on a monthly basis. So you should have a look to check that out. Um, and like I said, we have a new cluster. It's funded by the AI Collaboratory, which is also hosting this 
Summer of AI. Um, the UQRCC is also looking after it as part of this new Bunya cluster. Uh, we're currently testing it here at ITEE. Uh, there, as I said, there's three server nodes with two terabytes of system memory each. So we've got heaps of memory. Each server has three of the latest A100s, as I said. And these run, you know, they're double the speed of the V100s, around 20 teraflops. So they're monsters. So we have a total of nine A100s. And the idea is maybe three of them will be split into smaller ones. So we'll probably have around 16 to 18 total GPUs available. Also uses Slurm. One node will eventually run FastX. And I'm going to show you what FastX is. It kind of simplifies all of those procedures I've shown you before in the TLDR. Um, and the FastX is sort of like a friendly user remote desktop-like environment. So it's almost like you sign in in a remote desktop to a virtual machine that which you can just then run like as if you were signed in a, in a workstation. Here's an example. So um, it basically run it through your browser and you log in and you get a desktop. And then you can just, here's a 3D example of using a GPU, but you just run it like you would if you were logged into your local machine. Um, and we actually have this running at uh, on Vina at the moment, as far as part of the CVL um, laboratory. And so when you log in with your browser, it looks like this. And it's a Linux environment. And you can see what you've got been allocated to. And you have a Tesla T4, which isn't great, but it's running CUDA 11. Um, and you have eight, up to 800, up to 180 gigs of RAM. And once you get that, uh, you just run your scripts locally like it was a desktop. So you don't have to run Slurm. You don't have to, well, you may still have to set up your environment, but that's what you got to do for all of these things anyway. Other resources available. Like I said, we've got this compute lab. So it is actually in 78336. It's a UQ teaching space. Um, so there's deferred exams running on it next week. So we won't be able to use it next week, but we can use it this week and the week after the next. Um, and it's accessible to UQ students and staff uh, via timetabling. Time so I've actually, book this in during our hacky hour. So from two to five on the Fridays, except next week, because next week they're running exams. Um, and so you, if you're an intern or a summer scholar, you should be able to get access to these 2080 um, RTX video cards. They only have eight gigs of RAM, but it'll be good for learning and debugging your scripts. Uh, and you can do it via basically showing up or by a remote desktop. Um, and we may, if you're doing it in a remote desktop, we may need to set that up though. So um, on site, it would probably be easier if you do it on site. Um, now there are some cloud services available for UQ staff and students. Uh, obviously we have the Microsoft suite of things. So you've got the Azure services. Um, UQ also has this AWS Educate program. So there is a series of um, courses available on that. So you can have a look. And of course you can, if you're a staff member, you can actually request Google Cloud faculty access for educational purposes. And you have to go through some hoops to get that one. Everybody though has access to Google Collaboratory. So there's a nice intro video here, but basically it's just a website. You can go on there. It has a Jupyter Notebook style interface. So it's like a um, it's like an interactive um, cell-based thing. I hope if you haven't seen that before, we'll may talk about it in the Getting Started series. Um, it has limitations though. You can only use it for three hours. You have to put your data on the cloud, which may be stored overseas. So there's some ethics issue there. Um, but once you do um, have code, it's easily shareable. You can share a link like any other Google document um, and only needs a browser. All right, so I'm gonna finish up and pass this on to see you soon. So in conclusion, we've got a lot of state-of-the-art uh, AI facilities. They are server-based ones, mostly. 
uh, we've added some new ones. And Banya, which is this big new initiative by UQ, is adding more GPUs in the next 12 months, which should be good. Um, plenty of resources and training is available. Um, obviously, we're running the summer of AI right now. Um, yeah, and that's it. So um, I will stop there and pass it on to see you. But before I do, is there any questions that I can answer? Um, does anybody have questions or? Yeah, just some, some comments uh, since I was involved in the early days. Uh, it sounds like the FastX interface is still under construction. Uh, yeah. There's an incredible focus from HPC on Slurm interfaces. And you know, my whole, whole point of getting this network together was to have something that was, you, you get straight into it and take code off the internet and use it without a whole bunch of configuration and choosing machines and, and various things. So I suppose from my point of view, I don't really care about the machines. I was just really interested in the FastX interface. Uh, to make it, uh, you know, I wanted as much as possible to be like you've got your own machine, um, and uh, you can just you know do things on it and have control over it. So, I, you know, I'll, I'll reserve judgment, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm certainly keen on seeing this uh, fast X rolled out, and just having more slurm machines doesn't change anything. You know, we've got plenty of slurm machines around, and they seem to have this fascination with slurm up at uh, HPC, but it's, it's not appropriate for, for learning and experimenting and deep learning. It's, it's, you know, good for running big jobs if you know what you're doing, but none of us really know what we're doing, and we're always fiddling around. So we really just want, you know, a, a, a GPU access in the easiest possible environment. So no, no criticism, just basically uh, what we would have hoped after all this time that we would have had the fast X up and running fully. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally agree. I, I think this slide is a great indication of the gatekeeping that's involved in trying to get to this point here. Yeah, um, yeah that's, that's what I mean. I mean, we paid for the machine and we sort of said we wanted the fast X interface and you know, there seems to be this HPC fascination with Solom interfaces, which to me takes us back to the 1960s. You know, they basically yeah. submitting batch jobs. I, mean, I, I did that in my undergrad. I used paper documents. And I used a paper clip to push the holes out and put them into a machine and get a batch job run. I mean, that's that's where we're back to, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's not, it's not acceptable. And as I said, Berkeley has an entire uh, IT group set up just to support deep learning. So it's, they're, they're specialists in, in just supporting deep learning research. And it's across the whole university, which is where I think we should be going. It shouldn't be a part-time job on the side. That should, there should be a dedicated deep learning research unit who really, you know, understands these needs. Yep, absolutely. And and this this system, you know, it's a bit of uh, it's it's a bit of ir irony involved. The system is designed to get the most use out of the hardware, but it has the opposite effect because it stops it has, people using it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, that's what I mean. I mean, I want the thing, you know. I don't mind if it's inefficient. I mean, it's bloody inefficient having a PC on everybody's desktop that's dedicated to just one person. As soon as we walk out of the office, that machine's not used, but it's bloody convenient. You know, it's 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 the way things should be um, be done. And so, you know, they have this you know thing on how how much efficiency can we have? And that, that, see, that didn't care what job you run. We used to have an academic. Uh, uh, he came in and he, he was famous for basically blowing up every supercomputer by running stupid jobs on it that just you know, chewed up huge amounts of time. And you know, you can. It's easy to make these machines run really efficiently, but they, you know, like yeah, I don't know if he achieved anything ever with all his massive jobs. Uh, yeah. it, it's like you know, calculating digits of pi or something. It's easy to you know clog the machines up. It doesn't mean it's, it's useful. You know, a useful machine is. You know, it's like a car, you know, a good car drives well, you can get into it, it's easy to use. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not just the motor, you need a lot more user interface, you know? Yeah. Anyway, that's my, my, my bitch for today. I know we're all trying and we're moving in the same direction, but, uh, you know, there does seem to be this fascination with uh, having, as you say, have a machine that's unusable, that's heavily used. And in fact, if the machine's heavily used, it, be, it starts to become unusable as well, because what's the point of going through the whole slurm thing getting there, and this is what my students have complained about, they get there and they get pushed off by everybody else on the jobs and they can't get their jobs run. They much prefer to use the machines that I have here where they get uh, direct access and they, they don't have that competition. You know? Yeah, yeah, no, we've experienced that as well with Vina um, being clogged with a lot of jobs. And yeah, it, it's, all, it's also sporadic as well because you know when the conferences, big conferences come along, <laughs> everybody's using the system at the, all at the same time. So I think there is a disconnect that, you know, 
there's the this idea that we use we we generally we use hardware all the time mm -hmm. and that we use it for a long periods of time whereas our use is very sporadic yeah you, you want a very high speed for a short period of time so you can yeah. see yeah. if your idea worked yes. and then you better go, go fiddle around for quite a while changing code and, and then you exactly. want another fast and burst slurm is like the opposite of that it's mm. it's it's designed for long use very uh uh very uh laminar kind of workflow where you run jobs for a long time and you run them not very frequently mm. um and so it it's sort of good for the old days where you had a lot of jobs for cpus but for gpu and deep learning it's it's just not caught well on. it would be good for hyperparameter search where you set up a script and you basically and you have six right. knobs on your thing and you set every try every setting of every knob it's very easy to use up lots of machine time doing hyperparameter uh you know like you run a job that takes a day and uh, what you do is just clog up all the machines with every single hyperparameter which is good you know in, in a sense but it's not as useful as as you know doing something really original just changing the hyperparameters is a pretty boring use of gpu time you know yeah so i think the the plan we have uh here for the facilities that i'm trying to get is to sort of use this slide here to show you know the the anachronism that is involved with admin of these sorts of things and the users that are trying to get access to it and how we can simplify this. And I think some sort of user interface, FastX or whatever, is needed to these things to improve usage and accessibility. Well, and it's I not, think not just FastX. I mean, you can run FastX anyway, but you know, just the amount of crap you have to get through to start to run a job. You know, it's, it's all very local and specific and, you know, slurmy and things. I mean, you, you can't find much documentation on slurm. Uh, you know, like everybody else is running. It's just running it effectively on a, on a desktop, you know, straight on the Unix bare metal. Yeah. And, and most of the textbooks are written that way. Uh, they assume you've got a bare metal uh, Linux box with a card in. So it's, uh, uh, you know, when you try to run these things, you, you, you know, on slurm and things, you're just totally lost, you know? Yeah. And then, of course, there's the uh, there's the overhead of, for new students to get started in these things. Yeah, well, none of my students have ever kept working with Lena. They've all gone off and gone onto the um, uh, machines that I've got here. And uh, I'm, I, I, I will be uh, demonstrating a, a, a Docker swarm based uh, system, uh, which I'll give you access to and so on, which I've designed for undergraduate teaching, which you know gives you that uh, sandbox where each person gets their own uh, Linux machine and uh, they effectively act as root administrator on that machine. And if they bugger it up, they can get it refreshed. But I mean, you basically give them full control of the machine. And ideally, I'd like to give every student a, a virtual Linux box uh, that's, that's theirs uh, during their, their stay at UQ so they can you know, do what they like on the thing. And each, each person sandboxed in Docker. Uh, it doesn't have to be Docker, it could be Kubernetes. It's just, you know, they're, they're competing technologies. But uh, uh, I've been uh, following University of Versailles and other universities that have set up a nice deep learning infrastructure on, as part of a European project. And a lot of them are gone for Docker based solutions. Um, but, you know, I don't care whether it's Docker or whatever. It's just it's, you, you want this idea that each person's got their sandboxed Unix machine so that they can be root on the machine, but they can't kill the, the main machine. I don't know that we've achieved that in this this layout. But uh, you, know, you want, yeah. you know, if you give everyone isolation, then you can give people a lot of power. Mm. Yeah, now that'll be a great initiative. So mm. I think we should get that uh, conversation mm. started. Yeah, I've, I've been too tied up in exams. I had it all, all just about ready, but then, you know, exams yeah. hit and uh, COVID. So um, uh, hopefully I'll, I'll get a little bit done soon. Yeah, maybe I can organize some meetings and see, or send an email at least with this TLDR slide and get things started. And Well, this is all, you know, this, this is, the thing is, it not, not only the postgrads, you got it with a slim uh, barrier, the undergrads have got to go through slurm to use the machinery as well which is if, it, if it's terrible for a postgrad it's even worse for an undergrad to have that barrier to getting access to the machinery and what i want is is something where they have zero barrier and you know basically run it on, on a linux which is you know how everything's written in deep learning pretty much yep mm. all right great no that we'll we'll sort that out um Thanks, Brian. Uh, I think those are all valid points and we need to address that in the future. Yeah. Yeah, doing things with the RCC does feel a little bit like steering the Titanic. I know they've got certain drives and things, but as I say, that uh, tool, easy uh, instant access user interface is, is what we're trying to, um, to get for people.
uh, just to make it, you know, uh, it could easily go university wide. I mean, once you built the infrastructure, and this money was targeted for research only, not t t teaching. But I was hoping it would be a prototype for teaching. But if the students want to have to go through slow again, it's no different from every other machine out there, you know. Yeah. Yeah, no, we're definitely we can still build some prototypes on this bunny, I think. Mm. Um, it's just taken so long to get the hardware uh, yeah. in place. Oh, it's, it's very, it's very, very complicated. The Docker stuff's very complicated too. I've had to read so much, you know, to even understand what the hell I'm doing. So it's just, uh, you know, it's it, it's it's a big, complicated system to make make it easy to use. is is very, very difficult. Yeah. All right. Thanks. So, see you um, whenever you're ready. Can you um, share your slides and stuff? And we will see a live demo, hopefully, of how you can do these things. Um, now, before he starts, though, I showed you a way of setting up your environment and going through things. There are a few different ways of doing it, and uh, and there might be some repetition in CU's content, but that's also useful sometimes because you might find a, an easier or different way of doing things. Anyway, I'll let CU go from here. Thanks, CU. Hi. Hello. Am I audible? I hope my yep. audio is working. Yep. Good. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jax, for the for the intro, and uh, I'll just take you guys through all the HPC stuff, getting your job running. Because as we've discussed, it's quite a daunting task for a new student. So I hope to take you through the steps before we get a new solution. Okay. So yeah, just some overlap with Jax content. What is a HPC? So we got the notion that it's just a collection of computing nodes. Each node is like a small computer with lots of CPUs, GPUs, and RAM, and those computers are connected together via some networking infrastructure, and they share the same file system under the hood, and all of these computers act together uh, to run jobs for multiple users in parallel, right? Because these computers are managed by cluster admins, we don't necessarily have a uh, root access so there's a lot of workarounds we need to install packages, which is where the lot, a lot of the headaches is. And uh, from a user's perspective, so that was a sort of like technical perspective. From a user's perspective, it's really just a cluster of computing hardware available to us. And we still use this workload management system Slurm, to manage the resources and the workload. And it tries to allocate resources at our need. And these resources, once allocated, can be used to compute heavy jobs. So, so such as design simulation, fundamental research, optimization. So those use a lot of CPUs. And more recently for AI, uh, data analysis, we use GPUs. So these clusters host GPUs as well. And these are the clusters that Shakes have talked about. So for staff, we mostly use Winer. And there's the new AI collaboratory cluster as well with A100s. And uh, for students, uh, the Ramper cluster is probably more accessible because it's available by default to all the ITWE students and staff. So to, to, in, to communicate with these clusters through remote access, we actually need VPN. Uh, without VPN, these clusters will be hidden to us. We can't access them. They are off the radar. So you need to download the, a VPN client and you will need to have two-factor authentication enabled as well because most of them require that. So, to, to, so yeah, we still use this very ancient um, command line interface to talk with clusters for now. So if you're on Mac OS or Linux, you can just do SSH, your username, plus the address of the cluster, which I will quickly show here. So SSH, username, the address of the cluster. And the first time you, com you connect, it'll ask you if you, you trust the computing uh, computer you are going to connect to. You just type yes, but I've already done that. So it leads me directly to two-factor authentication. And I'll just see if I receive the notification. It's interesting, you can't even use a supercomputer without a mobile phone these days. The, the duo has meant, you know, you, you can't do your, your day job without a phone in your pocket the whole time. Mm. 
<laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So once we approve the two-factor authentication, it leads us to the login node. Okay. On Windows, you might not have SSH. You don't. You, you don't have the terminal directly, but it's PowerShell, which has the SSH command. You could also use Windows subsystem for Linux, which is just like a Linux virtual machine that comes with a Linux terminal. Or a more simpler method is using Party, so that's a SSH client you can directly use. So once you log in, it'll put on put you on the login node. Remember how I said a cluster has a lot of computing resources, but we actually can't access them directly because it needs to go through the workload management system. But at the moment, we're on the login node through SSH, and we can do some basic interactions. Yeah. And uh, just worth noting that we don't have root access here, which means we can't install everything we want. So everything needs to be, uh, so we can't use the sudo command. Okay. Yeah, well, immediately it makes the system useless to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. You can't sudo, you can't use it. And we can't use Docker either because, yeah, Docker requires root access. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so yeah, we can do some basic things like uh, creating directories, browsing around and install packages. So that's what the login node is intended for, right? Yeah, so the login node is really just for us to do some basic management, transfer code, downloading data, downloading unzipping files, just some basic stuff. Make sure you don't run computationally heavy jobs here because the login node is shared across all the users. So if everyone runs, accidentally runs the training code of a neural net, it'll slow everyone down. So you have to make sure you don't do uh, crazy CPU heavy jobs. So keep in mind. Okay, and uh, the cluster, the resources on the cluster are still managed through Slurm. So it's a workload manager. At the moment, it's installed on the cluster, which we can talk to. Then the Slurm manager will arrange the resources for us to do computational tasks. But it's quite an involved process, which I will show how we can interact with to get jobs done. Okay, now I just demonstrate a full workflow. We are just the user and we're trying to get Slurm to fetch some GPU computing resources for us so that we can run some existing code in PyTorch on GPU. And the first thing we need to do on the cluster before we even get to that is to get the environment ready. Because if we look at the cluster by default, Let's run Python and install and import PyTorch. You'll see that it actually does not exist because now it's just a blank sheet of paper with nothing installed at the moment. So we need to get Anaconda to install those. And Anaconda is available to us as a default install as well. So we can type module avail on the cluster, it's going to show us all the available packages and one of them is Anaconda. Mm. Yeah, it's here. So you can choose which version you need and you can just do module load with the name. Okay, but for me, I would like to have the newest version of Anaconda and uh, to have more control. So I actually, go to the official website and download the installer. Then I install the installer using the sh command followed by the downloaded installer. So that's going to allow me to specify where to put all the conda stuff. Right, so you can just... Uh... Yeah, so while C is doing that, just to comment there, um, to see you there is using mini conda. So the way I had it in mind was Anaconda, which is like the full system. It has a lot of overheads with it. Miniconda is like a stripped down version. So C is going for Miniconda. It takes up less space in your home drive, which is um, a good thing to do. So I recommend if you, if you are installing your own, use Miniconda instead of Anaconda. If you'd like the whole thing of Anaconda, use the system available one, because then most of that is uh, outside your home directory, so it doesn't clog up your home directory. Yes, 
That's right. So yeah, we go to the official website and we copy the link and we use the wget command to get that installer. And sh, you just run that using shell and we can supply a directory. So let's say your home directory is filling up. You can just put that on Scratch. So I'll talk about Scratch in a little bit. It's just a drive for us to put large files. Then after that, we can test that Anaconda is indeed available. Either you import or you install it yourself. We know that by typing Conda, and if it doesn't fail, immediately tell us command not found. If it tells us uh, what options we can do, then Conda is installed. And after having Conda, we can create a virtual environment, a self-contained environment containing PyTorch with just one line. So. Uh, this is wrapped in two lines, but it's actually just a very long command. Okay, the reason we use virtual environment is we might need to have multiple installations of different libraries. Let's say you want to run TensorFlow sometimes, and sometimes PyTorch, we just install them as two separate environment. If I want to use TensorFlow, I just activate the TensorFlow environment, then I don't worry about the PyTorch stuff. And we can switch between without having global interference between them, right? So the command we'll use is conda create dash dash prefix. I use the prefix flag just because it allows me to choose where to put all the installation files, right? You might've seen, so in Shake's first slide, you might've seen conda create dash dash name and give it a name, maybe TF, maybe PyTorch, but that's going to install everything in your home directory, which can blow it up. So what I would do is I just do prefix and specify an alternative root, uh, like a directory. So I'll just do scratch again. So that's going to put the directory, uh, the environment in that directory rather than the home directory. Then we follow it up with the packages we're installing. So that's from the official PyTorch getting started uh, guide. And you can see, yeah, we get, we're we grabbing PyTorch, Torch Vision, Torch Audio, and the CUDA bit. So that's all the dependencies we need to run GPU acceleration. So yeah, we just run that. But I've already have that installed beforehand because this is going to take 10 minutes. So just remember, once you type that, you just need to type yes to confirm and it'll install everything for you and store the packages in that environment. Okay, so once we install that, we can activate that environment by typing conda activate followed by the full path. Right, so that's the path we've set before. Just activate the same one. How do we know we've activated it? Once we type that, we can see that the prefix of your user prompt gets replaced with the environment. And now we can actually see which Python version we're running now. So type which Python, it'll show us what Python uh, interpreter we're using. And you can see that it is using the one within the virtual environment rather than the system installation. Okay, now let's test that installation and import PyTorch. And you can see it doesn't immediately fail and it actually finished importing. So that's a good sign. So the next bit is probably to get your code on the cluster. And uh, what I would recommend is GitHub. Right, so have your code, running code, working code ready on GitHub, and you can do the usual Git clone here. So I've actually created a demo project. So just call demo, and let's see what's in it. So in there, there's a main.py file. Just think of that as the training script of your neural net. And there's a slam script as well, which I will talk about later. And other ways to copy your code include uh, using SCP. So, so it's just a copy command. On your local computer, you just type SCP dash R if you're copying a directory of files and you follow, and it's followed by the source directory. 
So the code you're copying and then the cluster address followed by the destination folder. So here's just an example. So my project is a folder containing all my code and I'm copying that to the cluster. And that's the directory of the cluster I'm putting the file. And on Windows, you can use WinSCP as well. So that's a command line. And so, sorry, that's a GUI interface. You can do drag and drop with your files to copy them over. Okay, so now we need to, so now let's see what that file does, uh, what the main.py in my directory does. As you can see, it doesn't have any training, but it actually just detects if GPU is available because if it is available, then we can run proper GPU acceleration on it. But if we run that file directly, you can see that it actually prints out GPU is not available, right? Because the code it detects if CUDA is available and it actually says CUDA is not available. So that is because we can't actually get the resources directly ourselves. We have to go through this system called Slurm. So Slurm is what computing resource we need, what GPU need we need, what GCPU we need, how much RAM we need, and how long to run the job for, and what code to run. And uh, this is just a similar Slurm script to Shake's Slurm script. And you can see that I, it's a file, it's a bash file with some preamble, just some basic information, how many nodes am I using and uh, the number of tasks on each node and how many CPU ports, how much RAM and uh, which partition. So the partition dictates what type of hardware we have available. So in this case, on the Winer cluster, I specify the GPU partition that's going to give me access to GPUs. So here I'm just dash dash generic resources and I need GPU and the quantity is one. That's going to fetch us the hardware, but because Slurm will run this whole thing as a separate process, we also need to activate the same environment here. Right, so that's the environment we've built previously. We make sure to activate it in Slurm then we ask Slurm to run our main.py. And I'll just show you the Slurm file I've got here. So it's the same content, but it's just the activate bit, source activate. So you recognize that as my previous, uh, as the environment I've built, but here I have the path to my Miniconda installation. Remember how I said you can download Miniconda and set your own installation path. So that's the path I've chosen. So just make sure you get the Miniconda path and do bin activate. It's just a boilerplate because I found this way to be more robust across multiple clusters and it just never fails. If you use some other ways to activate, it can fail in Slurm. Okay, so after that you do main.py so Slurm will just read all of that, get the resources and run the code. And to submit that Slurm script with the job, we just type s batch slurm.sh. So this file, so it'll give us a job ID back. And if we type ls again, you can see that it generates an output. And let's see what's there. So it's not finished yet. Let's wait a few seconds. Okay, now it's finished. And you can see that it actually runs through the code and now it's detecting a GPU. Okay, now with all your PyTorch and TensorFlow code, you can easily just deploy your model on GPU and it's going to use the GPU. So when your job is running, there's a few things you can try. For example, maybe your job runs for a few days and you can check the status of your job by typing SQ 
So if you just type SQ, you will see everyone else's job on the cluster. Right, so these are what other people are running when how long they've been running it for. But you can just add a flag dash you with your username and you can see the job you have submitted previously. So I've submitted a job around 17 hours ago and it's been running since. And the status here is R, right, stands for running. So if it's something like PD, it means it's pending, waiting for resources. And you can see the reason why it's pending, why it's not executing. In this case, it says a max generic resource reached basically because the person is using too many GPUs. It needs to finish the previous runs before they can get more runs in. And that's a memory, it exceeds memory or it's just waiting for resource. And to cancel a running job, you can just do S cancel followed by the job ID. Let's say that if I wanna cancel this job, which I'm not actually going to do, but I'll just show here. So you can just do S cancel plus the job ID. And that's going to kill the job. Move the window. All right, so just remember that once you submit a job, it's going to run in the background. It'll wait for resources and run for in the background automatically. So it's okay to turn off this shell now and it'll run automatically. And the standard out will be logged in the directory you submit the job as we've seen. So it's learn with a job ID dot out and you can check the output of that job there. So just some other notes is that you can run multiple instances of the same job. You can submit maybe five or six of the same job, but just make sure that they don't write to the same output directory, right? So let's say that you are doing hyperparameter sweeping, just make sure that every time your job output outputs to a unique directory so they don't, they don't overwrite each other and be really mindful of the home directory qu disk quota because for example winer only have five gigabytes it can be quite easy to fill up so you want to move things like miniconda to the scratch drive or rdm uh, to to give you more space to work with and rdm is available on winer for example you can access it through the AFM 02 or 01, and um, you have the Q something followed by the ID. You can, you can find it there once it's mounted. Okay, so Scratch is there for you to put large files. Again, there's a Scratch drive and um, for large cache environment files or data, if you say, if you feel it's okay to put it there temporarily, but just know that Scratch doesn't do any backup. so there is a small chance you might lose the file in the future. Just put things that are not essential. And finally, if this Slurm stuff, um, you, you would like to see more Slurm options, there is a Slurm script generator, which you can just play around, fill in your own information and um, type make script, it'll make one for you. So I sort of used that to make mine as well and made some small edits on top of it. Okay, so that's it for now. So yeah, the most important thing is to get, if GPU is available to print true. So yeah, we have some questions in the chat. Yeah, I think I've addressed most of them. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, but yeah, are there any other questions? Um, any queries or comments as well? Um, what I might do is quickly just share my screen and go back to my TLDR, do a quick summary, and my shell script, uh, Slurm script. Oh, where's it going? So that's the 
the slim script, but if I just go back. Um, so this was how you would do it if there was an Anaconda module. Uh, so you don't have to do the whole download wget stuff. Um, it will save you a lot of space as well on your home drive. Sometimes that becomes an issue because on your home drive, that's another limitation of Slurm. You usually have a very a limited uh, hard disk space. Um, and to, to cater for that, you usually only get like five or 10 gig on Rankport. I think it's 10 gig on, on uh, Banya and Vina, it's five gig. And so there's not enough space for results or anything really. But that's where you would put maybe one of your environments, uh, but also your uh, scripts, uh, your source code, and all those other things, your outputs and everything. And so um, because of that, these clusters will also have a scratch space, uh, which is basically a communal hard disk space. And there you get like two terabytes or something. And that's where you can put your, I think, um, see, you mentioned that you can put your uh, environment, which would probably be a couple of gig. Um, uh, I turned, I needed to do this bit here on Bunya for some reason, but the, you probably don't need to if you're installing it yourself. Um, and that's how you activate. And there was the script stuff. So if I go back to my script, here's some of more options that you could use. So for Bunya, for, for our our collaboratory colleagues the partition is actually called ai the number of gpus you want you can give the, the mm -hmm. name uh, i've gone through some of these already uh, an important thing that you can do and one of the things that you might encounter is that it's a shared resource and so slurm is going to wait until those resources are available so if you ask for lots of resources there's a higher chance that you have to wait longer in the queue before those resources become available. It's probably in, best in, in your best interest to set the memory, the number of CPUs, the number of nodes, uh, and the total runtime. And you, initially you might not have one, so you might set this high, um, but you all of these match uh, to basically how big your job is. That way you are more likely to get the resources and the, your job to run um, at the shortest amount of time. Yeah, so the more you are, so if you ask for like 256 gig, that's in on on uh, on Bunya, that'll be fine. But on Viner, uh, 256 gig is the size of one node. And so it, a whole of Slurm will wait until an entire node is available before launching your job, which could take days, right? If, because some people, there's four GPUs per on Vita, there's four GPUs in one node. And so it's gonna keep giving out single GPUs to people and then work out on oh, this period, there'll be no, there'll be all four available and then give you the whole node. So it could take you a day in, in queue if you do that. Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, now I've got email type all, you can set this to error only or debug or cancel. And then you'll get an email and that's where you set your email. You can actually set the output name as well. So you can set this to a particular run name, whatever you want. Um, and it'll actually go, you can have a CD here. So it goes to a particular directory and it'll write that in that directory. On Banya, you, it's group level access. So this is only for the Banya for, for our AI collaboratory colleagues you need to put the account and you need to have the group name. So when you sign up, your leader signs up. So Brian, when you sign up, you'll be the group leader. You, you'll make a group name and this you put your group name over here where the X's are. Um, and that, that's required to make sure you get access to the AI partition. Um, and then yep, yeah, you load the necessary module. So if you did it my way with the Anaconda, you need to load the Anaconda module. If you did it the uh, virtual Python environment way, you would actually load CUDA here. Um, and Vina has different CUDAs. So you lo load the CUDA here, and then you switch to your um, a virtual environment and 
I've used Conda, so I go Conda activate. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I launch my job, which here I have, I'm actually trying to build an ImageNet model from the actual PyTorch examples. Uh, and their script requires how many, how many CPUs are you gonna use and how many, uh, when you're gonna output every 10 iterations, I'm going to output uh, the, the, the current progress. So what the loss function is, what the accuracy is, whatever. I'm gonna use the ResNet 50 model here, which is the architecture. And this is where the data is. Um, yep, and that's it. So the last thing I wanted to show you was what it looks like in Windows, because I use Windows. I know. Um, so I, this machine, so one way, uh, see you mentioned that you need VPN. So you only need VPN if you're remotely logging in uh, from outside uni. And if you're not using the um, UQ remote desktop login system, which is the rdp.eat. So if you're in the EAT faculty, you get access to, oops, you get it you get access to the remote desktop. So you can directly remote desktop in. So if you use remote desktop, what you can do is you can go into a machine that you probably have on your desk. If you're a HDR student or a staff, you probably have a desk with a computer in it. And here's my computer, this is it. And there, because it's already on the UQ network, I don't need VPN, I can start using all my things. And here I'm logged into the Bunyan network here. So I've got some ImageNet stuff. Um, I can look at what's what the state of the cluster is. And at the moment, the AI partition is mixed, which probably means that um, almost all of the GPUs are in action right now. Um, and of course, I can look at what I've been running, and I'm not running anything at the moment. Um, and... So what's the actual what's the actual script I'm using right now? I'm actually using uh, I've switched back to the Python virtual environment at the moment. I'm not using Anaconda. So let's have a look at that. Uh, blue is a bad color. I don't know if you can actually see that, but the script is almost identical. Um, except now I load the CUDA module. So I thought I'd give you that example. Um, and in this case, uh, in 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 Bunya, they've got CUDNN and CUDA separately. Uh, so I just load the CUDNN module, which automatically loads the CUDA module. So I don't have to do this first step. Um, then I just activate my uh, JAX environment, which is over here, and then run my script. Um, the good reason why would you use a Python virtual environment? Um, because essentially you just use pip. You just, in, you create a virtual environment in a particular folder, say in scratch, then you just do Python or pip install, whatever. Um, and you, and that's it. So you don't need all of the CUDA or Conda stuff. Um, you just need to make sure you load this module. Um, and what that does is it, you, you, you end up using the Python wheels from the PyPy package repository. So it's not fully optimized for CUDA. So it's not optimized for that cluster, but for the most part, it's pretty fast enough. So it may be two or three times slower, but it's still a thousand times faster than training it on a normal desktop without a GPU. So it's still useful there. Um, I use Vim, so I've closed that. Uh, now I do look, locally as well. So this machine has a 2080 Ti um, and I'd use the, uh, the Windows terminal, which is the new terminal and I run everything locally. So I've got, I've used pip to install uh, Jax locally to use my CUDA. So I've got CUDA, I think 11.2 installed. So just install the relevant CUDA to your, to the version of the framework that you're installing. So the latest version of Jax requires 11.2. The latest version of Py, or a stable version of PyTorch is 11.3. The latest is 11.6. 
So you install that CUDA and then, yeah, you just have a Python distribution, you got pip install and you're ready to go. Um, and then I just use good old VS code. Uh, here's my Slurm script. I haven't actually, let me close that folder. You can just load um, So here's me doing some stuff. I'm doing some stuff on Cypher and here it is. It's got Git integration. So you can see what happens to your files. Some extensions that might be useful for you if you're using VS Code, which is really nice. Uh, better comments. So you can do this stuff with your comments. Uh, if you're doing C++ programming, you can have CMake uh, extensions. Uh, Git lens is the Git thing that you can use. Uh, I use indent rainbow, which is very important for if you're doing Python. Uh, you can do Jupyter notebooks directly in VS Code, which is really nice. Uh, what else we got? PyLance and Python stuff. Um, that's the only ones I got. And I guess I could load a. I got a. Oh, you said here. So here's just running the augmentation stuff. So this is a Python. This is a Jupyter notebook. If you haven't seen one, um, this is the PyTorch example of running augmentation over images. It's, so what you can do is you have Markdown in text, and then you can embed code. And this code snippet here will support Python, Julia. Whatever, whatever Jupyter stands for. G U is J, J U is Julia. Pi Y is Python. Whatever. R, R is at the end. So it supports a lot of things. You put the code in. These cells are runnable. So you run them. Um, and then you can insert <clears throat> more stuff. And you can insert. So they're just running on your local CPU, aren't they? Uh, in, within yes. the VS code. So, you know, to get them to, to run on a a proper machine, I mean, you need something a bit more powerful. Oh, you know, you have to move this across to the slurm and everything. Yeah, so that's one of the questions, one of the, um, uh, that's pretty much it really. Oh, uh, yeah, one of the one of the options we have, Brian, is uh, what we did get ITS to do for UQ uh, via the UQ cloud was that they put a front end Jupyter notebook interface for Amazon AWS. Yeah. And so we could probably do that to, to Vina and uh, Anya and all that as well, which basically means, you know, when you file with one of these up, instantly there's a GPU in the background just like this, and you don't even have to worry about setting up environments and things. It's like a yeah, little... Yeah, the, I mean, there's, uh, the notebooks are, are, are huge, hugely useful for teaching and so on because you can embed all the, you know, directions and you run it a bit at a time and see what's happening. And that yep. sort of thing. Uh, there's, there's, you know, a lot of space. You see, see the big, the big thing with the highest performance computing uh, is that the big jobs are running were those bloody microscopes that generate terabytes of data, and they do convolutions on them all the time. And so, I think Slurm is very appropriate for microscope images because you just, you just got lots of them to do, and you just have to keep pumping them through the system. But it's, it's very different from deep learning. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So the last bit of a tip is uh, you can transfer stuff over using. A, uh, a, I guess a file transfer program. I use FileZilla. Mm. Um, and this is useful because using the terminal is painful. Um, so you can drag and drop. So, you know, I can copy over, I can copy over the SERM script I've got over there. And um, oh, I don't know if I'm mm. I logged in a while ago, but I can copy that over and then I can just open it and I can edit it. Here's the script that I was using. Um, I can edit it in my actual remote desktop over here and then copy it back. Um, you can do all sorts of things like, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's one other way. You use these sort of file browser to move things backwards and forwards. It's a bit painful still, but um, you could also do redirecting of X over here. So when you fire up a GUI based thing here, it actually pops up in your local desktop, but that's really slow. Um, and it'll slow down the login node as well. Um, so there's some things that are helpful. I find this way the best way because I 
Vim is great if you're <laughs> uh, if you're doing some very minor edits, but if you're going to do the whole programming thing, you could. I prefer VS Code or this mm. other editor that I got here, which when I fired it up, this is called Sighty, which is a very lightweight editor. It's like one megabyte in size, uh, instant. Yeah, it's instant in everything that it does. It does very little except programming, but that's useful um, and different to something like this, which is called a deve integrated development environment. You can see when it loads stuff, it's it's slower. The response is slower. Um, you know, this is several hundred meg. This is several hundred meg in memory. This is eight hundred kilobytes in memory. Um, and anyway, that's just me. I I do most of my programming this way, or sometimes this way. <clears throat> yeah, you can it, run it directly here as well. So there are certain things. VS like, Code is part of like GitHub. They used to have an Atom editor, which is deprecated now, and, and so the, the you know that's one good thing about VS Code that it's tightly linked to um, GitHub. Mm. Yeah, yep, yeah. and you can yeah, so you can upload things straight away here. Um, yeah, uh, I think um, yeah, I guess there's there's a lot of options out there. There's PyCharm, there's Spider, um, but yeah, one thing you shouldn't use is Idle, which is the default Python editor that comes with Python. Don't use that; that's really bad. But you know, use one of these other options. Um, yeah, Win SCP is good. Uh, somebody's asking a question there. Uh, Win SCP is an alternative to yes. Parzilla. That's good. Good code. Yeah. Yep. I think you'll find that on all of the EH machines. I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's a paid one though. Uh, we've paid for it, so yeah, go for it. Personally, you just use Filezilla or some other open source alternative. But yeah, if you're on the EH machine, just use SCP. Win SCP. All right. I think that's all that we wanted to cover. Um, uh, one thing I, I'm interested in is uh, FastX is fine, but I'm quite happy with XRDP uh, or X11RDP. Uh, is there a problem with supporting that? It just means it's consistent with uh, uh, using remote desktop everywhere in, in the... Yeah, that's an interesting... I, I think like a virtual machine setup and then you just have remote desktop into it would also... Well, no, you just have to install some Linux drivers. Uh, you know, the, you just put the package on and then you can just use uh, uh, your remote desktop to connect to the machines rather than having to think of a different... You know, like FastX, you have to go through a web browser, remember what the site name is and everything. It's just, it'd be, it'd be nice if it would connect. you could connect to it the way we connect to every other machine in the university, which is... I don't, I don't see why not. That wouldn't be a problem because... I think FastX is just the front end to the virtual desktop, virtual machines. Uh, it, it's it's it is a, it is a front end, but it doesn't use the IDP protocol. It uses a, a, a different, you know, it uses a FastX protocol, which is proprietary. Um, you know, and, and so is uh, RDP. It's just that it's proprietary, but part of Windows. Yeah. So uh, in, in in practice, uh, they work exactly the same. It's just it's just that. You know, currently, if you want to connect to any machine on campus, you, you use the RDP. And the good thing about the RDP connections is you don't need to use the VD, VPN because uh, uh, RDP uh, doesn't need to go through the VPN. Yeah. Uh, which, which is, you know, because the only two protocols that are allowed through the uh, uh, between networks is uh, SSH and uh, uh, RDP. They're the only two, every, HTTP and everything is blocked. Yep. So that's why with HTTP, you're going to have to use a, uh, a VPN. But if you use RDP, you can just connect straight to the machine without any uh, um, VPN. Yeah, that would be great. Like, you know, because we as EIT users just uh, just use remote desktop into the uh, RDP.EIT or dot whatever. Yeah, yeah. But it's the only you protocol apart from SSH that's allowed through the network, between yeah. networks. You get options staff and different student. machines. Yeah. You get options for different machines. And maybe one of those machines can now be like this virtual... Hmm. Um, not FastX, but XRDP machine. That yeah, you can have both. You can have FastX. They, they, they can both be running at the same time. It just gives you, it just means we'd have consistent access to it that's consistent with every other machine in the university. Yeah. Because that, because that protocol is the only one they allow apart from SSH uh, without um, a VPN. And that, that happened, you know, during uh, COVID, you know, because everyone was wanting to do remote desktop and so they got rid of the VPNs and so RDP became the uh, only other allowed protocol. Yep. Yep. I think we've got a question about uh, 
suggestion for testing DL code on HPC. So we've shown you a partition which is uh, dedicated for Slurm scripts, but I think all of this, there's a dedicated debug partition for running your code as a debug. So which means it's a very, uh, there's some GPUs allocated which rapidly allocate you a GPU for a very short amount of time so that you can just run debug. I think you can just debug your code. So um, uh, I don't have the information with me directly, but uh, I can just probably hmm. pull it up pretty quick. Um, yeah, you often just want to check that it, whether it's going to crash because you don't want to wait three days to find out your program crashes. Yes, that's right. Mm. You know, you wait in the queue for like a day mm. and then it runs for a little bit and then it crashes. Um, um, yeah, so, the, so, in, uh, so here's the link. Uh, let me just share my screen for that bit. So down there you scroll and you get to this bit where they have this test partition. So you can run your code quickly on this test partition. And supposedly it's for you. Yeah, the wait time is fairly short, uh, but only run for a very short amount of time. It only have a wall time. So the amount of time that you're allowed to run anything on it, a job limit of 20 minutes, there you go. So um, it's designed for quick turnaround where you can just debug stuff. Uh, and I believe this will be, this is also available on Bunya as well. Uh, and, and uh, well, I'm not sure if it's available on, on Vina, but yeah, it's available on rank four. And so you can sort of use that to help. Okay, I think if there are no more questions or comments, I think we'll close the session. Just so, if you have a problem with the cluster, and it, normally people just email the help desk, uh, but is there a different help address for uh, cluster problems? Um, I think there's one, yeah, so each of the clusters has a different uh, uh, email address. So for Viner, I think it is the QBI help desk. All right. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I think we'll close it there. Thank you, everyone. We'll Cheers. The next session's at one o'clock, so we'll see you then. Thanks but for yeah, all your efforts, so, Jakes, and uh, thanks to you. Yeah, no worries. Thanks, Brian. Uh, to uh, finish answering your question, yeah, there's, there's one for um, there's one for uh, Viner, which is the QBI help desk one. The one for rank four is just the usual uh, uh, IIT help desk email, so you just send it to them. Uh, but for Bunya, we're actually on uh, Zoom chat. And I think you'll get an invite to that once they've processed. So I'll, I've already let uh, Molly know about that. And you'll get added to the Zoom chat channel and that's where you can get immediate response. So they're all looking at that. You can get a response within seconds to any issue, mm. which is actually pretty good. Um, and hopefully they'll put you on there soon. Yeah, yeah. As this becomes more mainstream, I'm a little bit uncomfortable about having all these different cues for addressing problems, uh, rather than having something more, um, you know, centrally triaged. Uh, I don't know if that's if it's possible just to send a help desk and they can send to the appropriate queue or, or whatever. It's just that it's, it's a little bit hard for the users when there's so many different help lines. Yeah, hmm. yeah. I'm not sure how to deal with that one. I think maybe that could be part of that user interface that we want to create. A unified mm. user interface probably has a help button, which then goes to the right spot. That might, yeah. Man, something like that would be helpful. It's just just trying to remember all this stuff is pretty hard. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm. no, fair enough. Mm. All right, cool. Thanks, Thanks everybody. We'll catch you uh, in a few hours. Mm. Yeah, bye. Bye.